Okay, maybe if we could start with uh, telling me about the new ministry, which, what kind of do, what uh, the previous uh, um, offices, institutions could not do, what is the new mm -hmm. uh, effect of having this new ministry? Sure. So we're in the Ministry of Digital Affairs, or the MODA, uh, which has been started since like August uh, this year. During the three years or so of the pandemic response, uh, I work very closely as the digital minister at large uh, with many different digital agencies embedded within larger ministries that are not digital ministry. So, for example, uh, encountering the pandemic, of course, we have to work with the Ministry of Health and Welfare. Uh, but when it concerns data flow, including personal data and open data, it was under the National Development Council. Uh, and if we need to work with, uh, for example, uh, the uh, e-commerce, then that was under the Ministry of Economic Affairs. Uh, if we need to work with international uh, like IP numbers and domain names, that used to be under the Ministry of Transportation and Communication. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we need to work with like 5G deployment or satellite internet, that used to be under the National Communications Commission. Uh, and I can go on, the Department of Cybersecurity and so on. So all these are not quite ministries, mm -hmm. uh, but under the CECC, the Central Epidemic Command Center, we work in a very quick iteration, like 24 hours iteration. But for topics that are not counter-pandemic, uh, if you go through the usual bureaucracy, then it takes a very long time because it requires like four ministers plus three ministers at large uh, in order to agree on anything. Uh, I, I mean, don't take me wrong, uh, we work very closely and we trust each other. It's just the sheer logistics of scheduling meetings uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. is a, a lot of challenge. So. Nowadays, we're facing uh, a new emergent uh, challenges that are not quite a pandemic, uh, yet shares many similar characteristics. Case in point, like the cyber attacks. We face millions of cyber attacks daily uh, from abroad. Uh, and to uh, add to, to that, we've seen the cyber attacks work now in tandem with foreign information manipulation or propaganda. And so to weather these almost like earthquakes. There's uh, three failed earthquakes somewhere in Taiwan every day. So mm -hmm. we need to be resilient. It's not that we don't build buildings because of large earthquakes, but we need to build buildings with resilience in mind. So the MODA's uh, mission is to uh, have digital resilience for all, working with all sectors. And to be resilient, it means to respond in an agile fashion and transform ourselves. So we uh, look at all the third level agencies that used to work very closely during the pandemic and say, uh, let's just bring them all together into a new ministry so we can keep this working in tandem rhythm, uh, even uh, without the CECC and a special counter epidemic act. I see. I see. So. So this is basically, would you say that this is the main task uh, mm -hmm. of uh, your ministry of resilience? Right? Yes, it's, it's about resilience. And we have two administrations under the ministry. The administration for digital industries is in charge of uh, digital transformation for the private mm -hmm. sector. Uh, and the administration for cybersecurity is in charge of uh, safeguarding our critical infrastructure and our government network. So uh, one is more <laughs> rotational, <laughs> like it has to talk with like the journalism, with all the sectors uh, involved uh, with digital transformation. Uh, and the other one is more like a protecting role. But on top, the ministry proper is all about resilience. Mm -hmm. Besides of uh, mm -hmm. pulling all the strings together mm -hmm. in this new ministry, uh, did you all also invent new uh, new instruments? New instruments mm -hmm. to, for example, to uh, mm -hmm. enhance the resilience and to warn mm -hmm. off uh, yeah. cyber attacks yes. or info uh, attacks. Yeah, I'll, I'll use one example: uh, the Ukrainian um, situation, right? The, um, aggressive, brutal uh, war uh, from Russia to Ukraine <coughs> has shown us, uh, like I remember uh, at the night of uh, Kiev's uh, first uh, assault, 
I stayed up all night and refreshing uh, the websites of, I think it was the Kiev Independent, uh, the, the local media, uh, trying to figure out what's going on. And at the time, there's a lot of disinformation going around. Uh, some say Zelensky has already escaped, some say to Lviv, some say to Poland, uh, and so on. But yet, uh, because they were able to keep the broadband internet open, uh, we see uh, footage, some live footage and some video. We see Zelensky saying, um, I don't need a ride, give me ammunition, and, and so on. And that was very uh, instrumental uh, in shaping our communication strategy because in Taiwan, uh, we rely on the submarine cables for almost all our uh, connection abroad. So if they're destroyed by earthquake or artificial earthquakes, uh, then, <laughs> then uh, from people around the world, uh, the local journalists, uh, including the international correspondent that used to be in Hong Kong, but now are probably all in Taiwan now, um, or used to be in Beijing, uh, then they cannot get the message out and the disinformation will win the day, will win the war. Mm -hmm. So, uh, which is why we are now uh, focusing on working with uh, non geostationary satellite providers in mid and low Earth orbits, just like Ukraine does, uh, to send the broadband connection to journalists, uh, especially when the submarine cable gets destroyed uh, over the next couple of years, uh, we'll invest uh, 15 million uh, euros or dollars, the same now, uh, to uh, this project to build more than 700 mobile or fixed satellite receiving points uh, to provide emergency uh, communication. So things like that, uh, which combines 5G, <clears throat> like miniature 5G towers, uh, drones, uh, and emergency response service, uh, and satellites, and digital service, and cybersecurity uh, would not be easily planable or imaginable in the previous configuration. But mm -hmm. now, because all these functions are within the moda, so we can plan it very easily. Mm -hmm. um. You, you talk about digital resilience. Um, mm -hmm. You also mean not not just the the, the 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 government level or the state level, but also mm -hmm. company level or also private yes. levels, right? Yes. Day to day citizens. Also. Citizens, exactly. Mm -hmm. What uh, what do you do to help the citizens uh, mm -hmm. uh, to to enhance their their resilience? Yeah, um, a couple of things. Uh, first of all. Uh, we work with other ministries. Uh, for example, nowadays uh, all the school children uh, in basic education uh, have um, laptops or tablets uh, starting from the semester. Uh, of course, that's provided by the MOE, the Ministry of Education. But it's one thing to have the device and another thing to gather, to use the device as a co-creational tool, not just a tool to watch video. Mm -hmm. uh, and by co-creation, I mean, for example, fact-checking the three presidential candidates as they're mm -hmm. having a debate, uh, participating uh, in producing media, not just consuming media, which is what we call competence, uh, not just literacy. Uh, and so uh, participating in the fact-checking doesn't mean that all the children uh, suddenly become professional investigative journalists, of course, uh, but this process uh, builds an immunity in their mind against uh, polarization against mm -hmm. outrage, against conspiracy theories. Uh, so this active civic journalism, for example, uh, is one of our uh, main idea of social resilience. Of course, uh, we have not forgotten about professional journalists. So the administration of digital industries is now scheduling talks uh, starting uh, later this month uh, with, uh, I think it was Alphabet, that's to say Google, YouTube, uh, and uh, Meta, that's to say Facebook, uh, to ensure that um, they can see the importance and the public benefit of the professional journalism sector uh, and share their advertisement fueled uh, revenue uh, to the professional journalists. And that's also our job. Uh, so we see journalism uh, to the disinformation crisis very much like uh, epidemiology, public health, mm -hmm. uh, to the pandemic. Uh, not just a few experts, but if everybody learns something about uh, epidemiology, about washing hands, social distance, and things like that, then people can take uh, voluntary responses 
uh, responding to the emergent uh, viruses so that we can coexist but still have the upper hand uh, in containing the worst uh, of the virus. Uh, because without this social resilience, we'll be forced to adopt a lockdown, takedown, shutdown, mm -hmm. top-down uh, mode of, I don't know, zero hate or something, <laughs> <laughs> which is definitely not what we're doing here. Um, would you, um, of course, you, you invented a new, uh, in the, when you were minister without portfolio, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you invented a couple of uh, uh, new, new political styles, yes. so, you know, mm -hmm. um, could you, can you mm -hmm. use, or do you also invent these, or mm -hmm. did you, Bring these styles yes. also into the new ministry. Yeah, the radical transparency. <laughs> right. Yeah, right the radical transparency. Right, with right, the right, video right. and the transcript uh, yeah, and yeah. so on. And, and it's quite uh, interesting because now I'm getting a lot uh, of pushbacks. Like I had the hardest time convincing the BBC hard talk <laughs> to let us to simply release the transcript to the commons free of copyright. Uh, because really? yeah, because they they uh, they think they uh, they really want uh, journalistic integrity, uh, right? So, uh, but I uh, finally uh, convinced them, saying that we will uh, honor uh, journalistic independence and we will publish the hour after you do. Uh, so mm -hmm. we will embargo our, our transcript, uh, <laughs> okay, okay. And, and so on. So it takes a lot of back and forth. Uh, but but I think uh, because we're we're after all not a a media studio. We're we're not in it for the. Uh, Uh, for the uh, what's the English uh, scoop <laughs> for the scoop uh, we just want to make sure that uh, when people want to learn the context in which our conversation happens uh, if they want to refer to earlier conversations or look at the entire transcript there's somewhere else uh, other than the edited version uh, for people to look into so you can say that um, we're providing a contextualizing service Uh, to the not just journalism but to the entire civil society so that people can understand not just the what of policies being made but also the how of policy making and most importantly the why of policy making. In our mostly uh, ministerial meetings with all our departments and administrations, uh, the entire transcript is also published, is open, uh, along with mm -hmm. my uh, mostly report of what uh, our uh, department and administration uh, did. Uh, and so, yeah, people have sometimes compared it uh, to a kind of, kind of like a virtual reality to us. If you put on, you have a sense of what the minister <laughs> feels like <laughs> in her office. Did you also uh, conserve your sense of flat hierarchies? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. And as you can see here, uh, we have a very flat uh, workspace. I'm, I'm on this sofa, of course, but everybody is on laptop, uh, mm -hmm. is on those moving chairs. Uh, and mm -hmm. so uh, we were just having an all-hands meeting uh, downstairs, and people just brought their laptops and their chair uh, to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and in uh, any given time, if someone from the administration uh, or the, the MODA uh, want to, to reach me, they, they just come here. Uh, and I spend uh, a couple of days a week here uh, and uh, three days a week in the other office, the Yanping office, the cybersecurity uh, administration. Mm -hmm. So the two administrations kind of each share half of my uh, work hours. Uh, so it's a little bit like the office hours that I used to do uh, in two offices. Um, speaking of cybersecurity, mm -hmm. um, of course, the danger is growing, right? Mm -hmm. Would you say that, that the, of the, the danger of, of, of cyber attacks? Mm -hmm. uh, you spoke of millions of uh, cyber attacks mm -hmm. every day. Yeah, so and which growing? more than doubled uh, last year compared to the year before. Ah. So it was like two million per day. Now it's like five minutes per day, uh, and and now okay. maybe even more.
So uh, does it also mean that you need more people to uh, mm -hmm. defend yourself against these attacks? Yeah, definitely. And also we need new ways of thinking uh, about defense. Uh, we're now adopting what's called a zero-trust architecture, uh, which means that we assume um, passwords will be stolen. We assume uh, devices will be compromised. We assume that network connection will be faked and so on. So uh, when I sign any official document, even during the seven-day quarantine when I was diagnosed with COVID uh, at home, um, this device checks for its integrity on the software side, the SIM card, the connection, and also my fingerprint uh, on the device. So uh, only when all three match can I sign an official document. And uh, like two minute, two seconds after when I was sign another official document, uh, document the, the the three gets revalidated again. Mm -hmm. So it's assume breach, like assume somebody have taken over the phone uh, during those two seconds. Uh, and it, it sounds extreme, but because there's no passwords for me to type. It's just putting my fingerprint a couple of times, it's okay. Uh, and uh, if one of the three gets breached, uh, the other two factors keep uh, the breach contained, uh, that it doesn't uh, cause real damage uh, while we have the time to do forensics and so on. So it's a new way of thinking about cyber defense. Yeah. So, okay, this regards your... Um your ministry, but of yes. course, cyber attacks are not mm -hmm. only directed against your ministry, exactly. but also yes. uh, mm -hmm. against other so institutions. So we're, we're spreading, and... yes, uh, this idea. So um, another idea is called asymmetric uh, defense. That is to say, to uh, force the attacker to throw a disproportional amount of resource. Uh, while we don't have to spend as many resources to defend uh, one example. Our website is built uh, with the help of the Interplanetary File System, or IPFS. is a key Web3 technology that allows more than 200,000 computers around the world. Um, anyone can donate their spare hard disk and connectivity to keep the Moda website uh, Alive uh, to keep us resilient, to be a voluntary backup node. Now, uh, when we uh, provided the service uh, through our Web3, it means that uh, if any attacker want to take our content down, they will also have to take down the Web3 storage of the board ape yacht club, the NFT pictures, and so on, because it's, it's the same uh, backbone, uh, and and it's very difficult actually to 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 take down the entire cryptocurrency ecosystems. So by tying us to the backbone of the Web2 and the Web3 content delivery networks uh, is one uh, asymmetric defense toward a distributed denial of service attack, uh, which in early August we reached a peak that was previously um, like um, not many people. People use DDoS. Uh, so at that time in uh, August, following speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit, the peak of the attack of that day was 23 times higher than the previous peak. So, like, really something. But our website <coughs> wasn't down for even uh, one second. Now, to popularize the idea, we uh, if you go to our website, there's no copyright reserved. Uh, so not just the content, uh, but also the architecture, the code, uh, the bridge to the Web3 and Web2, uh, everything uh, is what we say containerized, meaning that uh, it's shipped as modular uh, blocks and uh, uh, free of copyright uh, in the Creative Commons CC0 in the public domain. Uh, so other ministries, certainly starting with our two administrations, but other ministries can adopt this architecture free of charge. And their system integrators uh, can focus on customizing the code instead of uh, procuring things from scratch. Uh, this is exactly like how um, Estonia, uh, Finland, and Iceland share the X Road system. Uh, they share the maintenance of the public code between themselves. Uh, now we're looking to join other uh, DFI countries, Declaration for the Future of the Internet, the DFI countries, and in providing this kind of public code uh, to strengthen the resilience for all the alliances. Uh, would you say that internationally seen, mm -hmm. you're at the forefront of mm -hmm. the, <clears throat> of the, the attacks, <laughs> the, the defense, <laughs> of the defense, of the defense uh -huh. capabilities? Yes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. definitely. Uh, our systems are quite literally battle tested. So, um, are there? 
people from other countries <clears throat> um, and mm -hmm. experts from other countries coming to you to mm -hmm. get uh, advice from you? Yeah, definitely. Uh, we have regular uh, video meetings. Uh, the DFI itself, uh, actually, the Declaration for the Future of the Internet, uh, is turning into a real multi-stakeholder, uh, hybrid, uh, multilateral uh, forum uh, that allows us to share such ideas such as public code, data altruism, and things like that uh, between the trusted parties. I was just in one of the DFI ministerial uh, meetings talking about that. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, this also works over the internet. Or, or yeah, so, so I mean, all our code are on, on the public internet. Mm. So, for example, when the UK, uh, the GDS, the Government Digital Service, uh, designs a very nice accessibility-friendly uh, website design system, uh, we simply adapted uh, that uh, and uh, changed a few colors. So mm. our, I was just showing uh, the Minister for International uh, Trade uh, from the UK uh, who visited uh, this morning uh, that his website and our website look almost identical <laughs> because mm. they release as public code and then we ad ad adapted this public code. Uh, but if they want to, for example, take our Web3 resilience work back, uh, again, it's in the comments. They can take that back anytime. How important would you say is um, um, informing the broad public? I mean, you, I, you also invented some uh, new styles of communication, mm -hmm. as far as I know. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. I even saw you dancing in a video. Yeah, once. humor over rumor. Yes, that, that's humor my style. Ah, that's great. It's, it's called humor over rumor. If you go to my uh, Flickr, Uh, there is a lot of Creative Commons Zero, meaning free of copyright, uh, pictures that are internet memes. So you can see, for example, me doing all this, which are popular internet meme uh, shapes, right? So, and, and this is all free of copyright, meaning that uh, comedians from all around the world, the onion, why not, uh, can, can freely uh, use this without me suing any of them. So, uh, in a sense, uh, we know that humor spreads faster, maybe it's the only thing that spreads faster than uh, outrage uh, online. And so to counter conspiracy theories and disinformation type based on outrage, uh, we need to counter them with humor, and that's exactly what we're doing, uh, that's a including the dancing, yes. <laughs> so that's the dancing and then the piece. I'm sorry? Lenny to take picture. Who needs to take picture? Oh, oh. It's almost done, it's okay. Everyone is waiting for us, but it's okay. We got time, we got time. Yeah, we, we got time. Okay. It's fine. Mm -hmm. No one is rushing. No, no one, one is <laughs> rushing anyone. <laughs> Great. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but, but that's that's a very interesting point, I think. Uh, do you have more examples of... I mean, I just saw the dancing and I now I saw these memes. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, what else would what you else? Would, what fits into the strategy? Yeah, uh, the for example, strategy? Uh, as I mentioned, when... Uh, This August, after Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit, uh, there was uh, a few hours where the website of the Ministry of National Defense and Presidential Office uh, were disrupted by mm -hmm. the uh, denial of service attacks. Uh, and while people could not have access to the original website, the disinformation was rampant, saying that uh, the hackers has taken over the president's office and so on. But of course, it's not the same, right? To dial to keep a line busy is not the same as actually uh, occupying the building, right? It's not mm -hmm. the same thing. Uh, but uh, we really need to get that message out. Uh, so I said very publicly back then uh, that our website, moda.gov.tw, went online exactly the same hour as the drill from the PLA happened. Uh, and in a kind of defiant but also humorous uh, move, I asked everybody to attack our website. Uh, <laughs> say that we welcome penetration testers worldwide, uh, be the red team, uh, try to take us down by one second. Uh, uh, and, and in doing so, uh, by explaining that we use IPFS and so on, uh, it uh, put a more lighthearted uh, mood uh, to the situation. Uh, and people learn by association that uh, dialing to keep a line busy is not the same as taking over the command center. Yeah, yeah. yeah.
So, these, did, 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 did you know whether many uh, tentative attacks happened after, after you invited them to attack? Mm -hmm. did, were there many? Yeah, many people many did actually tested uh, our defenses. Do you but, have numbers? But because it's distributed. Mm -hmm. Right, so uh, anyone from uh, abroad, from anyone over the world, can help us backing up our website. So when an attack happens, it's not connected to our computers anymore. It's um, connected to whomever that's nearby. Uh, okay. uh, so, so we don't have the numbers because <laughs> it's yeah, entirely yeah. distributed. So it's a distributed defense against a distributed denial of service attack. Uh, and to, to make that happen, uh, we need to make a few architectural changes. For example, there must be no login button, right? Uh, because uh, it only works for uh, publications, like when everybody sees the same. Uh, if there's a login button, uh, if there's custom uh, information on our website, then of course it wouldn't work. Mm. So our website uh, is turned into what we call static, uh, meaning that uh, all the updates, including video and so on, are hosted in such a way uh, that it uh, doesn't matter who, where in the world access it. Uh, so there's some architectural changes, uh, but I think it's it's really paying real dividends uh, because it promoted a very healthy conversation around Web3 technology. The Protocol Labs, the inventor of the IPFS, noticed our uh, innovative use uh, and got in touch, and that led to more like mutual recognitions and uh, community events uh, and so on. So, so I think this really also change people's mind about, you know, the crypto world only does, I don't know, scams or uh, fraud <laughs> or get get rich quick, uh, things like that. The same distributed ledger activity can actually be used for cybersecurity defense too. Oh, yeah. And being tamper-proof is not just good for scams, it's also good for countering cybersecurity attacks. Yeah, sure. You just mentioned, um, oh. mm -hmm. To, uh, after my question, you mentioned that uh, you needed a lot of new personnel also yes. to fend off all these uh, yes. attacks. Mm -hmm. Can you give me numbers? Mm -hmm. How many new, um, well, yeah, how many new um, recruits? Uh, recruits did you mm -hmm. did you did yeah. you need for? for sure, sure, sure. Did you have that? Right. So uh, by the end of next year, uh, we are estimated to have six hundred uh, people. Uh, just for cybersecurity? For, for the entire moda. For the entire um, moda. But in addition to those 300, we'll set up a new institute uh, of cybersecurity, the NICE, National Institute of Cybersecurity, uh, which will have another 200 or 50, 250 people ish uh, dedicated to cybersecurity defense with uh, the private sector and uh, critical infrastructures uh, on the more and also international partners. So um, look, look at this way, uh, that our ministry currently around 300 people uh, will double uh, in our personnel to take care of both the industrial transformation, cyber security resilience, as well as this social resilience part. Uh, but the cyber resilience, because it's so important, we set up a extra new institute that's almost um, half of our size uh, to to defend it, uh, and hopefully it will get set up uh, early January mm. next year. So, how optimistic are you that uh, you will have mm -hmm. the, the the defense power, the mm -hmm. cyber defense power, to mm -hmm. also in future be uh, victorious over mm -hmm. the, the, mm -hmm. the millions and growing number of attacks that uh, yeah that yeah I, I think uh, this when I say battle tested uh, I really mean uh, that people can come to trust Taiwan for not just our semiconductor chips which is of course very trustworthy but also the entire cyber security supply chain that keeps our chips safe uh, we have the semi e187 standard from Taiwan that protects the entire supply chain around chip making. Uh, and so I think these two uh, go hand in hand. It's not just a purely defensive role to mm -hmm. mitigate attacks, but when every time we successfully mitigate a type of attack, we turn that into a cybersecurity product and services uh, that can be of value uh, to the entire world. And it also helps to have the branding of MIT made in Taiwan, uh, for the T also stands for trustworthiness, uh, mm -hmm. so that a chip can be trusted, but also everything else that is manufactured in Taiwan can be trusted, protected by this battle-tested cybersecurity industry.
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think. You need to save some yeah. time for for, yeah. for yeah. Yeah. Okay. to take a okay. picture. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think. Um, huh? Yeah. Then I, I think I give the photographer a chance to do his ah, work. Okay. But, uh, maybe just I, sometime on the way there, you can ask like, one last question. <laughs> but, but do you have uh, one last question? Or? Uh, yeah, I think. Yeah. Um, maybe let's uh, do uh, one more. But okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, well, I, I just have to look at them. Mm-hmm. I was a, was a bit nervous now because uh, I thought that uh, uh, yeah, but uh, mm-hmm. I read you personally coined the slogan "Free the Future." Oh, right? free the future. Yes. Uh, how mm-hmm. uh, optimistic? That's a good, I think, good last mm-hmm. question. How mm-hmm. optimistic in general are you about Taiwan's mm-hmm. future? Yeah. Um, so Taiwan is physically caught between the Eurasian plate on one side and the Philippine Sea plate on the other. Uh, which is why we have thousands of earthquakes, failed earthquakes uh, per year. Uh, but among all these uh, tension, uh, the tip of Taiwan, the J Mountain, Yushan, raises by a couple of centimeters per year. Uh, and so that's uh, freeing the future. That is uh, operating on a um, collaboration across diversity, or even collaboration because of this shared sense of urgency. Uh, so I think that that uh, keeps me optimistic. Now the moda, uh, which I understand some European language means fashion, uh, <laughs> means motor here, uh, influenced by the Japanese uh, Nihongo moda, uh, which means ah. motor. So we're a new motor of sorts to power the connection between the civil society and technology, uh, between the industry and the cybersecurity community, so that we can all do co-creative uh, resilience together. Okay. Uh, that's a good last sentence. I would say thanks a lot Thank you. for your for your time and for your mm-hmm. uh, for your for your mm-hmm. really uh, interesting words. Thanks a lot. Thank you.